Do you love your favorite cheat meal or dessert, but then the next morning you wake up feeling like gross and bloated? Well, I have found this new greens super powder that helps with that. And right now, Bloom is offering my listeners 15% off if you go to bloomnu.com slash holly. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest today, I want to tell you guys about a really special event that my friend and fellow pleasure podcaster is co-hosting. Um, she's Nicoletta from Sluts and Scholars, and she is co-hosting an event with burlesque star Michelle Lamore. It's called Into Pleasure, and it's a day of online interactive classes to help you maximize your pleasure potential. Featuring diverse intimacy experts, this event is designed to help folks connect to their bodies through different pleasure practices. You can buy the whole day, for which you get an awesome gift bag as well, or you can pick individual classes. All of the in-depth details and info will be at intopleasure.com. The event is happening virtually on April 2nd from 9.30 a.m. until 5 p.m. So make sure that you guys go check it out. It sounds like it's going to be a really amazing experience. That's intopleasure.com. All right. So now let's introduce my guest. She is one of the hardest working women in the industry. She performs, she directs, and she does PR. She's been recognized as MILF of the Year, year after year. Welcome, Tanya Tate. Hi, Tanya. How Thank are you? you? Hi, Holly. I'm great. Thanks for having me on here. It's so great to see you. Hey. <laughs> so um, I guess let's, uh, let's start from the beginning, like I do with a lot of my guests. Um, you're obviously from the UK. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you're from and how you got into the adult industry and perhaps how um, the adult industry in the UK is different um, than it is in America. So I, I'm originally from Liverpool in the UK, which is the same place as the Beatles. Um, <laughs> a lot of people are like, who's that? <laughs> um, so I, I started off there. Um, I was working in an office and I'd kind of finished that job. And I was looking for, um, well, I'd finished a relationship, sorry. And I was looking for something more exciting in my life. And I was sitting there with a, a male friend and he put on a, dvd in his house and he was like whoa look at this it was an adult actuated dvd and i was like hmm, yeah kind of sitting there arms folded and i he was watching it getting excited and i was watching it thinking oh i could do that and it was literally that kind of moment and um so i went and researched the uk market um some of that research involved going into an adult store and getting the dvds down and writing them down from the back of the dvds the name of the studio the name of the website i'm reaching out and trying to contact them and i reached out to a few different companies in the uk some of them liked me invited me to london shot me and i made my first scene in the uk in 2008 um so i shot several scenes for several companies um and by the time 2010 come, um, I was looking to make that next step. So I moved across to Los Angeles in America and started um, shooting for all the big production studios um, over here, where I am now, based in LA. Um, so it was kind of like taking the next step. And I'd say UK is kind of like really like a, just a small version of LA. You know, at the time, there were just a handful of studios, really. There were studios in Europe, um, but in the UK, it was just really just a handful. And to kind of like get that next step, I felt that I had to move um, somewhere different, to go somewhere different, to, you know, to get, to get shooting with the recognized companies. At that time, you know, they didn't have like outlets. There wasn't like Brazzers or Tushy or anyone that was shooting outside of america um it, it, it to get in there you really had to kind of like move and moving across and then shooting for some of the big production companies you really saw the difference in the set you know 
big mansions, um, the sets, the budgets were a lot bigger. There seemed to be a lot more people. It seemed to be more glamorous. Um, so it, UK, I'd say, is kind of like a scaled down version of, mm. of the U.S., Tell us about your very first scene. Um, do you remember who it was with, what company it was for, and like what were your thoughts going into it, and what was that actual experience like? So my first scene was for a company called Joy Bear Pictures, where I, it was kind of like made to be like a documentary. My name was Sue. Um, so some people are like, oh, it's Sue. Was- <laughs> and the guy that I was working with was a guy – at the time it was his first scene um and oh wow we we were like he turns up i think it was it i'm sure it was his first scene i'm i'm so sure it was i'll have to ask him next time i see him um you will now know him there's danny d um oh no way (laughs) that's amazing because he's one of like the biggest male performers in the uk that's incredible that you guys had your first seen together wow yeah yeah so he, we both kind of came in and you know I was like thinking oh how's this gonna go it was a really small um I was in somebody's house so it was really small crew I think maybe just two guys and a makeup artist um and just to go in there and then suddenly see the package of what you're going to be working with you know Danny D is very well endowed, very well endowed. And I was like, oh, wow, this is, yes. yeah, <laughs> it was a bit scary. And, you know, I kind of got into the scene and we started the scene and I just kind of felt a little bit like a deer in headlights. But I thought, you know what, just switch off, just enjoy the scene, enjoy what's happening. And when I look back at it, I, I can see I'm a bit... Oh, with the, you can see in my eyes, I'm a bit like deer in headlights, but it also looked mm-hmm. pretty natural as well. So it ended up, it's quite enjoyable and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as bad as I, anyone could ever think oh, you first seen on camera. I, I think I just focused on what I was doing and just tried to forget about the cameras there. And it ended up being, you know, a really, a really decent scene for my first scene. Yeah. Well, and also like, especially if it was Danny's first scene or even one of his first, you know, handful of scenes, I mean, you know, for the guy, you know, it's obviously a little bit more difficult for him in certain respects. Right. So how, how was he, did he, was he just kind of a natural and like he was able to perform no problem? Um, (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Well, when you're very well endowed, you've got a there's there's a knack to keeping um, the blood flow going mm. down there. So, you know, at the beginning, you know, we all have little things that we work on, and you, you know, for for Danny, I I think I I've done scenes with him later, and I think he progressively got a whole lot better at maintaining what he needed yeah. to do as a male performer. You know, and I think you know. It, it worked. It, it definitely worked, you know, but I think as he progressed, it that, that was, you know, it was one of his first scenes. But yeah. from there to like now as a performer, he's a totally different performer. You know, now he's an yeah. extremely strong performer. Um, he's won many awards. He's, you know, contracted for one of the big companies. Um, he was known as White Zilla. You, you know, it's he, he's come a long way. Um, yeah. So I was, I feel like, you know, very blessed that we could help each other in, in that first scene, you know, and I, I did give him help to, to keep him. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to use my words, right? Aren't I? <laughs> trying to keep him <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, you know, I've interviewed a lot of male performers and most of them struggle their first couple of scenes because it's, you know, it's very intimidating. It's a different experience and, you know, there's a lot of pressure on you. So I'm always interested to hear, you know, how it goes for guys at the beginning. And then, you know, obviously, usually if I've interviewed them on my show, they've become great, strong performers. And just so that, that, you know, that progression, um, is always super interesting. So, 
Um, so you, you came over here and you started shooting for American companies. Um, how did you, was that your first time that you had ever been to LA? Like how did you acclimate to American society? Was it very different from home for you? Um, I'd, I'd been to America before a couple of times, Los Angeles, um, Las Vegas, but coming on like holiday slash vacation mm. is different than coming over here to work and to live. Um, so I have to say like LA and like LA, California, Southern California, they, you know, it's very similar to the UK really. Um, the cultures, it's, it's not really a lot of difference. It's just things that you have to get used to, you know, the customer service, the expectation of tipping on everything that you do, you know, so I could just go to the toilet. Do I need to tip you? Cause I, <laughs> in England, we tip when we get good service. In America, tipping is expected, even if the service yeah. is a load of crap. You know? Yeah, that. it's yeah, it's funny. I've actually been. I remember, you know, because I've been to England many times because my mom's from there, and I remember going to a pub once and and getting a drink and then leaving them a tip. And the bartender like chased me outside, and he's like, "Oh, oh, you left your change on the table," and I was like, "That was for you." And he was just like really puzzled. It was just this, this, you know, interesting moment of like, you know, obvious, because you're right. If you, if you don't tip a bartender at an LA venue, even if they took an hour to get your drink, then you're never getting the next drink. It's very much expected here. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I remember one time before I even moved here, I'm being in Las Vegas on the car, they, they, um, valet had like picked the car up and drove it and I get in the car and they were kind of like literally like hand out and I'm like are you sticking your hand out for or did you pay for this ballet and I didn't tip them because I didn't know yeah. and I can remember just yeah. door getting slammed and I do just like look at this course and I was like how rude how rude that person <laughs> because they expected a tip it's the expectation no you know, yeah. you give you give good service and you get a tip. So, but, and I think there's the customer service in general is a different kind of culture as well. You know, I love when you kind of call like the UK bank and it's like they're all so nice and and um just general customer service in general in the UK is a, it's a lot higher standards. Um, mm -hmm. Different places you call in the US and you're like. Oh, Oh, <laughs> you're not mm -hmm. sure. It's like you got what you wanted, but you're not going to get yeah. anything over and above, you know. Um, yeah. So I, I guess that was a little bit different. And, you know, British people, I'd say in general, are definitely more polite, please and thank you. And holding doors open, like in America, where, I, where the experience that I've had, it's just like, yeah, you might get a please or a thank you. You might just get the door just slammed in your face as you're walking through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but apart from that, I'd say not not really a lot of difference. You know, the weather. You know, we have many yeah. many hours and days of sunshine in LA and you know UK. It's, it's cold and rainy a lot of the time, especially in the northwest. But I have yeah. to say sometimes I, I I do miss that rain and I do miss that green grass. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, my husband, my ex-husband was, um, well, he was actually from Nottingham, but he had lived in Manchester. So we used to go visit Manchester pretty often. And I remember we went there, I think in the winter and I couldn't believe it got dark at like three 30. I was just oh, like, yeah. Oh my God. Dark really early. And then yeah. it's still dark the next morning. It's like eight o'clock. Yeah. It's like, yeah. if it, I could be going to work when I worked in the office, you know, you come home in the dark and you get up and leave in the dark, you know, and then if it's rainy or it's foggy, you're like, oh, <laughs> give me some yeah. real daylight. What do you miss the most about the UK? Family. Mm. And the people and the sense of humor. It's like, yeah. I, I, I will literally watch British shows. I'll watch soaps, UK soaps, Coronation Street, EastEnders, UK Comedians. Um, you don't really get that in the, you know, the U S it's kind of a different kind of humor. And, um, it is. I remember watching the office, the original office with Ricky Gervais 
in the UK and thinking it was just so brilliant. And then watching the American version and like not being as impressed. I think nobody does like awkward comedy the way the British do. Like they've yeah. got that, that down. It's pretty amazing. You can't translate it. You know, they, they, they changed the office into the American version. They did shameless, yeah. like shameless. It was based in Manchester in the UK about some like just messed up family. And it, you know, it was funny. And then they did it in America. And I was just like, ah, don't translate. They did yeah. Little Britain. They changed that into Little America. The, the British humor, if you're trying to make it like an American version of a British comedy show, trust me, it's never going to work because Americans can't do British comedy. Yeah. It's just a, <laughs> it's a different, yeah, it's just a different, it's a different kind of comedy for sure. Um, all right. So what was the first what was the first scene that maybe you really were the proudest of? Like the first scene that you did that you felt really accomplished and that you had gotten somewhere in your career or maybe the first movie. You can ask me a question. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know what it is, Holly? It's like, it's been like, I don't even know how many years, at least a decade at least a decade since I started shooting. And there's just so many scenes that you've done and so many movies that stand out. You know, if you're asking me about something that was would, would really stand out the most, I'd have to say Tanya Tate's sex tour of Ireland. Um, and it was it, that's what it said on the tin. It was a sex tour of me going around Ireland with my camper van and I met a load of Irish lads and we went to a load of different places. Um Tipperary, Cork, Dublin. Um, I can't remember where else we, we went to. Um, but it was literally going around and meeting these lads and inviting the lads in, come on in, lads, come and make me camper van rock. And it, it was, you know, the Irish are a lot of fun. You know, I miss the, the, the British sense of humour. I'm from Liverpool. Liverpool, we have a lot of Irish settlers in. Um, people settled many years ago. And you know, the Irish and the Liverpool sense of humour are pretty similar. The lads, you had a great crack. You know, we had a crack with the Irish. And they, they were a lot of fun. And from there, you know, the movie got produced and it appeared on Television X, which is like the UK TV channel. It's like a, a UK adult channel, you know, a pay-per-view or prescri subscription kind of channel on your regular TV. And suddenly, like, the papers went wild. Like, the newspapers went wild in Ireland. And there I am, splashed all over the front of the newspapers. So people in, like, the UK and Ireland, you know, the thing was you go to the the, the local store, the local shop on a Sunday and get your, your morning newspaper and bring it back and sit down and have your breakfast and read the paper. And there I am, splashed all over the front page. Um, and it, it was because it was very shocking. I think for Ireland to be like, this woman is scandalous. She's come, she's made all these men, like she took them in and made them all, you know, all these sins. Corrupting our youth. Of, <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. And I'll tell you now, you had to apply. You had to see it. You had to apply for it. You had to turn up for it. You had to sign the paperwork for it. You had to be willing for it. You know, I didn't literally go out there with like a big net and be like, I'm dragging you in. These guys come very willing, very oh, willing sure. indeed. And um, I, I think it was just shocking for, you know, it was, it was a big deal in Ireland at that time. Um, for me, I was kind of scratching my head, but then I realized, you know what? It was like an opening for people in Ireland to start talking about sex. I was just mm. very, very hush, hush you know, brush under the carpet. Ireland's a very religious, very religious country. Um, and, you know, the, the Catholic faith is very strong. It's, 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 it's a very strong faith, you know, especially in the older generation. And to come in and, you know, religion and sex don't necessarily go down well for some people. And it was, you know, that mix that, oh, so someone can be religious and, oh, Oh, and then they're having sex. Well, let's be honest, we all have sex. Just some people do it on camera and some people don't. Do you think it was also because you were a woman? 
but they maybe they were jealous of me. <laughs> a beautiful you know, woman. But you know what I mean? Like a woman going out and like, um, you know, enticing men, you know, there's, I mean, you know, we come across this so often men can go and sleep with a lot of women and it's like considered, you know, Oh, like you're a stud and, and it's, it's glorified. But you know, if a woman does it, um, especially if she does it kind of from a place of power, then there's a lot of controversy around that. So, I mean, basically, do you think if a man had gone out and done the same movie, do you think it would have had the same reaction? Like a man went out and had sex with a lot of women in Ireland. Uh, interesting question. I, honestly, I I don't know, but um, I think sex in Ireland would have been controversial either way. So right. whether it was like you know that shameful woman, whether it was because I was a woman, and you know, I I, I guess for some people, seeing a woman with a lot of power is mm-hmm. kind of unnerving, and mm-hmm. it's the power that I had in my hand to entice these guys to come in. It's like that forbidden fruit, isn't it? Like yeah. I feel like yeah. one of those beautiful queens that goes out and it's like, hey, has the apple with the poison on? But but it wasn't really, was it? It was like, here's the icing on the cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Tanya's PR company. We're going to talk about Tanya's podcast, MILF's Making Money, and what advice that she may have for new performers coming into the industry. So hang tight. We will be right back. I am a big dessert lover. I absolutely have to have my sugar fix at night. And especially if I go out to dinner, there's no way I'm not ordering dessert, but then I feel really gross the next morning. So that's why I'm so excited about Bloom. It really helps me with my digestion and my bloating issues so that I can wake up the next morning feeling great. Bloom Greens are packed with over 50 nutrients, including whole fruits and veggies, fiber, probiotics, antioxidants, and more, all in one easy to drink formula. Mix it in with water or a smoothie to add to your daily routine. And right now, Bloom is offering my listeners 15% off if you go to bloomnu.com slash holly. That's B-L-O-O-M-N-U.com slash holly to get 15% off your order. Take charge of your mornings and get into that daily routine that's going to make you feel your best with Bloom Nutrition. All right, guys, we are back. So Tanya, on top of performing, you've also done some directing as well, and you have your own PR company. So tell us a little bit about these other side hustles that you do. Okay, so the the directing, um, that really came as a great opportunity for me. I was being in, I was casting a lot of different movies and one of the companies brought me into the office and they said, you know, Tanya, we we believe in you and we want you to direct some movies for us. And I said, well, I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, But then I realized actually I've been, I had been directing my own um mini in my own mini movies if you like for my website tanyatate.com whereas i was shooting a lot of content um i did do something called the tanya tate casting couch which was kind of like a bit of a playoff from the tanya tate sex tour of ireland and tanya tate sex tour of scotland which i i also did um but it was inviting fans to to come and try out on the tanya tate casting couch i thought you know actually i've done directing in a, in a indirect way um, so it was Philly Films and they um, offered me to make some movies and I made quite a few movies for them. Um, Le- Tiny Tate Lesbian Family Affair. So it was what it says on the tin. It was threesomes in different family, you know, not really family. Um, step family. Step, step family, yeah. Let's just say step mm. family, of course. You know, everybody that's in the movie, none of us are related. We're all over the age of 18, blah, 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 blah. But it was that taboo where it was like, ooh, family, hidden relationships. And it was like little scenarios and little twists and obviously a lot of sex. Um, So that was great. I kind of got to choose the women in the movies, you know, milfs, um, young, young hot girls, again, over the age of 18. Um, So... It was kind of like, I felt like a bit of like a kid in a candy store and, you know, I could be in some of the movies or I could 
be direct in the women and it it was really nice um to get to like kind of play out some of my fantasies and also you know for the for the women coming in the girls and the women coming in to have a woman you know you know this having a woman director it has a different feel for it holly doesn't it mm-hmm. you know as opposed to like a guy it's like oh get in there get in there whereas a woman we we understand what it feels like for a woman to be made to feel good like no man can ever know what that feels like so i i always think it's like it sent for me it felt like more sensual more real um mm. i also um shot some scenes for penthouse as well that went onto their website so that was quite exciting um so that was kind of like my first step into directing yeah and then uh how did you get into pr so for me, the PR company, when I was in England and I was looking to come to America and I was looking for a publicist, um, I had some friends in the adult industry and I said, you know, what do I do? How do I, you know, help get my brand to be made bigger? You know, and this person that's just coming in, there's all these people already established. So PR for me was a tool that I wanted to use and I was recommended Star Factory PR to, um, to, you know, use their services, utilize their services. So I started using Star Factory PR um, and an opportunity come up um, for me to take over. It was originally, it was originally um, set up by Mike Mars and Monstar PR and they kind of built it up. Um, And both of them, at at one point, both of them ended up um, doing PR for Digital Playground. So it was at that point that I kind of come on board and I kind of took over with an assistant and kept Star Factory PR up and running um, until Monstar PR come back. So we're kind of co-owners now. Um, so that's how we come up with that opportunity. So for me, it was really nice to be able to be able to help all the performers as well, you know, with brand and brand recognition, getting their names made bigger, you know, PR people think oh yeah I'll get PR I'm gonna get famous overnight and you know sometimes I have meetings with people and they're like yeah I want mainstream coverage I'm like okay well what's you know what's so special about you why the mainstream going to be interested in you and people don't realize it's not just you don't just click your fingers and you know you get mainstream coverage there's there's different things that our clients have had mainstream coverage over um but it's not just, hey, I make adult movies. You know, there's got to be something else that is mm-hmm. is, is going to be there. And it also involves a lot of hard work on the on the for the performer. You know, oh, we're going to come, we're going to get PR. Well, actually, you're going to get interviews. So interviews are going to take time. You know, you've got to put yourself out there. You've got to whether they're written, whether they're you know spoken, video, you know different in person interviews you've got to put that time aside and that commitment and i think you know people that come to us at star factory pr are serious about their career and serious about taking it to the next level and they're smart as well because they know they need something extra you know there's only so much you can sit there and you know blow your own trumpet and you know some people it's not natural to blow your own trumpet um, there's only so much that you can do without having someone he- behind you saying, hey, well, you know, what things have you been up to? Let us talk about this. Let us do press release on this. Let us let the the reviewers know. Let us let, you know, the people that are there that are looking at the award nominations, let us tell them about the things that you're doing. So it's having someone that's out there looking for opportunities for you you know, mainstream opportunities as simple as building up the contacts and, you know, hey, I've got this mainstream media website that's asking for quotes and suddenly there you are with a quote on a link to, you know, your Twitter or your Instagram on a mainstream website. So mm-hmm. it's it's about someone who's, who's going to be there to look out for you to help with opportunities. Yeah. And then do you help people put uh, like press kits together. Cause that's the one thing that I find when I interview a lot of performers that they don't have any photos of them. <laughs> they don't have like any information on them. They don't have like, um, I mean, I always try to tell people and I have one myself, like you need a press kit, um, basically a bio, some photos. Um, what kind of things would you suggest to people 
that they maybe have on hand should they get the opportunity to do a podcast or an interview or whatnot? Um, you know, for us, every one of our clients, we put together like uh, like a little m- mini press kit. So, mm-hmm. you know, you've had our clients on. You, we put one of our clients on. You, um, since Sage, she was yeah. recently. So, you know, for me, I I was helping facilitate that. It makes it so much easier, you know, to have mm-hmm. somebody there that you can go backwards and forwards to 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 set up the date and the time. And for that, you know, we have a, a bio on file. We have a list of our hair links. We have a folder that's got images in and we also have a list of talking points as well. So, you know, we put it down there. Even for me coming on today, you know, Holly, your assistant said my talking points. She's had my bio. It's like, here's all the things that, you know, you can, it's going to help you with the interview. Mm -hmm. So you've got it all there. And also it's it's good as a, like a, a reminder, you know, I've got my little list sitting next to me. I'm like, Make sure I tell tell Holly and the, the listeners about like all the different platforms and all the different things that I want to talk about. It's like a little list of you know reminders that these are the things that I want to talk about. So yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's a little bit of helping prepare both the interviewer and you as the person that's being interviewed. A reminder to to make sure that you talk about the things that you want to promote. Yeah. When you um, see performers who are trying to market themselves, get their names out there, what's one of the biggest mistakes that you see? You know, you can do a lot of good marketing for yourself. You you really can. You know, there's some people that are really smart and they're really great on social media. They're very interactive. Um some of the mistakes that I see people do, um, things that I really frown upon, um, it, it just doesn't sit well with me. People that cause drama on mm-hmm. social media, you can really see like inside somebody when you see them arguing openly, being mean on social media. And some people might think, oh, drama, I'll get all these followers. Well, you might get all the followers. But for me, that doesn't, I, I just don't think it's it, if that's the kind of brand that you want, like a mean person that's just like a bitch to everyone. Yeah, sure, go ahead. But for the majority of people, I I I, I don't think that that's a good fit. So you you know just knowing that when you're online, people are watching you all the time. They're watching what you're saying, um, and it's going to reflect somewhere. You know, I've had people and they've come to us and you know if i look on their social media first and see what kind of person that they are mm-hmm. and if i look at some of the things and i'm writing and i'm like that just doesn't feel right with the star factory brand i won't take them on as a client and you know sometimes it, here's the thing you know you 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 never know when you're going to need someone so you know if you're like really mean to someone or a company and then later on, it's like you get an opportunity. Well, suddenly that opportunity could be taken away from you from something that you did in the past. You know, yeah. I honestly, I've had people that are just being like really horrible or nasty. And then like my friends going to interview them. I'm like, nah, <laughs> you sure you yeah. want to interview them? No. <laughs> no. I have to agree with you so much on that. Um, you know, you say as a, as a, PR um, publicist that you look at their social media and that helps you determine whether or not you want to take them on as a client. And I will say as a producer, I do the same thing. You know, if I see somebody who's rude and aggressive and attacks, you know, other people online, like, I don't want to work with you. I don't want that energy on my set because there's a lot of amazing, beautiful girls who are like really positive, wonderful, professional people. Like, why am I going to hire you? You know, um, it's just that nasty attitude does not get you anywhere. And I, you know, I don't, I think people should express, I think there's a way to express yourself online. You know, um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in guests. If I see that they express that they're perhaps unhappy with something, or there's something that they wish that they could change, or they disapprove of something, there's something wrong with giving your opinion online, as long as, you know, it's in a kind of respectful and professional manner. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong either with like, you know, talking about maybe if you've had a bad day or, you know, cause we're all human. And I think that that can, um, people can emphasize, emp, emp, 
empathize, empathize with that, not emphasize, yeah. empathize with that. Um, and that can open up a, a connection with your fans, but I agree yep. that that nastiness and, you know, I saw a lot of that in quarantine. I think like a lot of people were just going stir crazy and they were stuck at home and they were afraid and they were angry. And I saw some like nasty, nasty, um, you know, behaviors come out of performers that I had previously really respected and, um, you know, change my opinion about a lot of people. It, it, it does, you know, there, there is a way, you know, if you have a difference of opinion, there is a way to express yourself. Um, and, and I guess mm. it's like the way that you express yourself, you know, the, the way that other people are going to see you. So just remember when you're marketing yourself online, it's whatever you do, whatever you write, it's, it's there, it's always out there. And even if you delete it fast, someone's probably screenshotting oh yeah oh yeah they definitely have so tell us about your podcast milfs making money what is uh, that about and what kind of guests do you have on so my podcast tanya tape presents milfs making money it kind of started um during you know the, the lockdown the quarantine and um there's a lot of you know it's kind of stressful for all of us and in different ways, you know, we wasn't, we, our lives were restricted and changed. And from there, it, it's, you know, are you going to get through this? And for me, it's a lot of positivity. You know, you've got to refocus your mind. You've got to think of all the opportunities, not woe is me. It's, it's looking at like seeing things in a different way. You know, we, we did, we had to change our work practices. We had to change our lives to accommodate things that were out of our control. So I think for me, it was, it was kind of come where, you know, I'm like, I can't, I, I just don't like seeing drama online, all this negativity. And I, I, I really wanted to just give something back to people and also, you know, sharing ideas for the other content creators. Um, I was a host of Vivid Radio for seven years, which is on Sirius XM. And that was great. That was amazing to just have an opportunity to be on air every week and you know speak to the fans you know in a in a different way they could call in it was like a virtual jerk off um so for me it was kind of like a little bit of a continuation of well you, you could see at some point vivid was going down they, we were off there for quite a long time because of course you couldn't do in-person things so it it was just the opportunity and the idea come up and I kind of ran with it um, so it's milfsmakingmoney.com and I got a, a podcast team to come on and help me. So it's syndicated on all the platforms like Apple, Audible, Amazon, Spotify, all, all the main ones, probably all the places. If you're listening to this podcast right now with Tanya Tay on Holly Randall's <laughs> podcast, <laughs> go to that search box and search Tanya Tay presents Milfs Making Money. And I'm probably on the same platform as well. So yeah. so go over there and give it a listen. So the guests, you know, I like to choose different guests. And it's all about sharing ideas. You know, how can, you know, all the content creators make money? And it's not just, hey, you know, I'm an OnlyFans. Like, hey, you know, here's another person. I'm an OnlyFans. Well, mm -hmm. hey, guess what? I'm on OnlyFans too. And I'm Tanya Tate. And I'm also on Sex Panther. Um, so it's it's coming up with a different angle each time um just just to give like different advice so other people that are listening can be like hey you know i never thought of that or that's a great idea or it's something that just giving them tips and reiterations you know we have covered different things from why you should need a lawyer and um dealing with fakes fake profiles online and you know, using YouTube and um, helping with different branding and mental health awareness. And th this, there's so much, you know, um, I've got things coming up, you know, how can you become a, a webcam model? It, you know, the, the basic steps of getting into it. So there's a lot of different things. Um, and I'm also open to ideas. So if any of the fans are like, you know what, Tanya, you should discuss this during, you know, your podcast or if you've got ideas you know you want a specific guest on and there's a good angle that i could get on it i'd, I'd love to hear 
And mm-hmm. for me, having a having a, a different input from the fans, you know, um, I also have something where they can leave a voice note. So speakpipe.com slash Tanya Tate is a place where the fans can go. They can leave feedback. They can ask a question. And I choose my favorite ones. And so they get to hear themselves on my podcast. So it's like, who am I going to choose this time? That's (laughs) a great idea. I do like Q and A's in my live streams, but I just read them out loud. But you're right, because some people do like to you know, hear their voice and then you can kind of have a little bit more of a connection with them if you hear them talking. So I might, I might steal that idea from you, Tanya. Yeah. (laughs) If if I see you with a speak pipe account, Holly, I'll be like, Holly, leave me a voice note. And you'll be like, Tanya, leave me one. I'll say, okay, deal. (laughs) Deal. (laughs) It's like, let's see. What's my chosen voice note of this week? Oh, it's Holly Randall. Let's hear what Holly's got to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a that's a great that's a great tip. I've there's so many like little things that you can do, um, uh, you know, in in content creation. That's that I'm constantly learning about. Like, so does your podcast? Is it is it just audio or does it go out on YouTube as well? Oh, Holly, here's the thing. Right, I really know that it should I should go up and do a video and it, and I should get the guests to, to like get ready hair and makeup I mean I'm hair and makeup ready for you today Holly but honestly it's like it it's here's here's the deal I'm a mom so I have to get up I have a child I have a four-year-old little boy and he's high energy I put the makeup down on the table he's picking up the brushes he's trying to put the makeup on my face here you go mommy <laughs> Everything that he sees me do, he wants to do. So so you're trying to battle with a four-year-old. So then by the time you've got him out of the house, then you then it's the time to do the hair and makeup, you know. And then it's like, okay, when's he coming back? Because now we're on hours. It's like minutes. He's going to be coming back soon. So you've got to get it all done within that time scale. Mm-hmm. And also when you're setting up the podcast, you know, I've got myself that I've got to accommodate the time. I've got my guest that I've got to accommodate the time I've got the web the the podcast team so it's it's kind of setting it all up and I keep saying oh at some point I'll do it but it's just it's extra work it's like an extra hour of time that I've got to find so as well as prepping the podcast and you know I the morning of when I do the podcast I do like my own little intro you know it's not all just the guests a big a massive chunk of it is the guests but I also talk about my week and you know, some little just food for thought, a little positive thought for the, mm-hmm. for the, you know, for the show that you can kind of refocus on. So it everything takes time. So I keep saying, oh, soon I'll do it. Soon I'll do it. I guess, I guess if I could sit there in my pajamas and sunglasses, we'd be sorted. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't have to do the makeup. I could just tie my hair back. And I always wear pajamas in the house. Like, couldn't you like, just get one of those like crazy Snapchat filters that like make you not look anything like what you look like and just do that? Maybe like some prince, a Disney princess cartoon. Cast yeah, there you like, go. The big lips and the big eyes. I'm like, here I am. I'm ready for my podcast. No makeup. You know what? The eyelashes sometimes flick onto your hairline. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, like the way technology is going right now, and we're actually seeing this, um, everybody, a lot of people know I'm working on a startup, um, the first erotic metaverse, but you will be able to eventually create your own avatar that, that looks like you, like these kind of, they're even like a step beyond avatars. They're like digital humans. And I promise you, Tanya, one day you will be able to do that and you won't have to put your makeup on. So your day will come. I also want to say that I never understood the difficulty of time management with children until I had a child. So I totally understand how you feel. Like I did not get it. You know, when people were like, I'm a mom, I don't have time. Like that never registered. And I was like, you can find time. You can like this. It's not that hard. Like just make the kid play in the corner. There is absolutely no way I can't get anything done with my toddler around. I mean, I'm on my laptop and she just hits the keyboard. She grabs the screen. She pulls it in. If I'm on a Zoom call, she steps in like this and she goes, hi, 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 hi. Like, I can't get rid of her. Like, I can't. She will not 
go sit in the corner and play by herself. So I just want to say that like, yeah. I, I feel you and I totally understand and I get it. I get it. It, it is it is really difficult, you know, from being a mom, like my, my son's four, he does go to preschool, but it's only like, it's only a few hours a day. It's not a, re- <laughs> it's not a school day. It's like literally just, it's the mornings. It's, so you're trying to get everything done as well as get yourself up and get ready. And when do you work out? Because trust me, I can't work out while he's there either because he's in my yeah. face. He's pushing things in my face. I have to keep stopping. But for me, it's like, you know, being a mom and then suddenly it's like, um, what am I going to do? How am I going to keep in contact with the fans? So I started actually live streaming when he was literally a baby. I would live stream every day from my kitchen because that was the only time that I could keep in touch with the fans it was on a YouTube when he's sitting in the, he was sitting in his high chair and I was literally feeding this baby that could hardly hold his head up I'm like here I am and it would be screams and all so people have seen him progress from like that little six six month old baby to like being you know four years of of us there so we do um live stream like once a week on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Tanya Tate Tube. And I also am on Instagram. So we Instagram live. It's simultaneously two, two, um, two live streams, instagram.com slash Tanya Tate XO. And um, so we, we, we simultaneously, he's so loud. He's full of energy. So it's, it's kind of giving people a different side. And I, don't, I do not wear makeup during them. I do not. It's yeah. just like you get me as I am. And some days you see the tired face and mm-hmm. some days you see like the really happy face. And <laughs> it's, it's just like, and when it's the tired face, you're like, oh, I'm trying to look like I've got loads of energy. And you're like, oh my God, I'm so tired. But you don't use it as an excuse. You just get on there and just do it. But it is, it's a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I completely relate. Um, it, having a kid is hard, but it's extremely rewarding. But it's hard. Right. And, uh, right. it's something that I don't think anyone really understands until they experience it. So, um, so before we wrap up, I just want to ask you, um, I want to, first of all, make sure I get these questions in from my Patreon members. Um, if you're a member of my Patreon, you can submit your questions, um, for my guests and they will answer them during the interview or in a special bonus Q and a, depending on how much time we have. Um, so not Marky Mark wants to know, Tanya, what is your guilty pleasure food? Guilty pleasure food. Oh, do you know what? It used to be white chocolate chip, macadamia, cookie. Oh, Oh, sugar and white chocolate. Just gorgeous. Um, but I had to change my diet. Um, I was diagnosed with chronic, chronic Lyme disease, which is kind of like, it's, some people don't believe it exists, mainly the insurance companies. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. It, it's, yeah. So I realized, long story, um, cut it short, I realized um, food was a trigger um, in inflammation in my body. So I had to cut out all kinds sugar, gluten, um, a lot of animal fats, gone organic. It's more about clean eating. So uh, I, I haven't had a white chocolate chip macadamia cookie for a long time. One day, one day, maybe in your dreams. Yeah. Um, and then I just want to acknowledge um, Danny, one of my favorite uh, and long-term fans. Um, we did already answer his question, but um, just to acknowledge Danny, I see your question. You wanted to know um, what the sex tour of Ireland and Scotland was like. And uh, we answered that. So thank you, Danny, for asking that question. And then, um, Tanya, I guess one of my last questions for you is being a a very successful veteran performer. um, What is one of the biggest misconceptions that you see people have about porn stars? One of the biggest misconceptions. I think um, people think what it is on camera is what it's like in real life. Um, I think that's like a really big misconception. Um, it, I have to, I, I want to talk about um, a little bit about like the change from being a studio performer to being a performer for the fans. Mm. And, you know, on a studio, you know, we go in there, it's all, you know, told what to do. This is how you need to do it, blah, blah, blah. 
but the change is like now it's it's like that is not how it really is in real life I think now we've gone more to how it is in real life you know I have an OnlyFans, onlyfans.com slash Tanya Tate. And I'm also on Sex Panther and um, sexpanther.com slash Tanya Tate. And they're the two places that I use to kind of keep in touch with the fans. And I like that I can now give like a real, like a real time kind of view of what it's like. Um, I, it's solo stuff that I've been given. Uh, being given the fans you know so I literally just turn the camera on and you capture whatever happens you see me without the makeup you see me with the makeup it, you know and it's I, I literally set the camera there on the stand and you know I do different scenarios a lot of the mummy the mistress um so for, for the fans I think the misconception is is like sex is like that polished up version that you get the, from the production companies well it's not really, you know, I prefer to say that sex is more about what I like to do on camera, you know, the the way that I'm given that that instant um excitement for the fan and it's 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 more directed towards them, you know. Make them mm-hmm. make them feel I, I want the fan to be part of the excitement when they're watching it as opposed to someone's telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely more of like a personal connection with the fans on these various social uh, content platforms, like you said, OnlyFans and Sex Panther. And by the way, I would also just like to point out that um, you can tell you come from a PR background because (laughs) when you mention that, you're like, and here's the URL, which by the way, is so smart. (laughs) And I should actually, I should pick up, I should pick up on that because I don't, I don't really do that. But that, that seems like a... Good habit too. And for me, for me, there, Holly, it's like I'm now. Now I'm going to tell you something where I've just crossed the line. Where I'm like, oh yeah, those social media platforms, the premium social media. I, I've got to tell you because probably some of the fans are probably. This is something you didn't ask me, but they're probably curious. You know, we've spoken about mm. me making the movies and you know the production companies, and you know now I'm I'm doing all you know. The, the video charts and the phone calls and the texting and the sexting and you know the little video clips that the, the fans can can get from me on my sex panther and only fans but i stopped shooting you know i had a baby i stopped shooting and then kind of coming back from having a baby kind of getting back on camera it's it's like it's nervous you know you, you you're nerve-wracking and it's it's i have to say i really appreciate the fans that they've been there with me along the journey you know from looking at me in the YouTube sitting in the kitchen with a screaming kid. So like now it's me, you know, being there for me when it's, when the traffic, all my fans, the the only new stuff they can get from me is, is on the premium social media platforms. And I was really excited to give them something that they were asking for. It's like me coming back, doing scenes with another girl. Um, So I did a scene with Phoenix Marie that's exclusive for our premium social media platforms. So that was like my first girl, girl scene after five years of nothing um so right now you know i'm contemplating do i do something a little bit more i've literally just shot a strap on scene um with a guy you find out different things that the fans really like to talk to you about a lot of my fans like um the 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 mummy mistress you know asking Mm -hmm. anything of them whether it be the strap on type of scenario um so i've got a brand new strap on scene coming up and I mean, I'm going to tell the fans, I'm really contemplating doing a scene with another guy, a full, mm-hmm. full on sex scene with another guy. And it's not mm-hmm. going to be for a production company. You know, we we are controlling, you know, us, the, the stars, if you like, we're controlling where, where the fans can see us. And I'm seriously contemplating doing something with a guy if the fans are going to really show their appreciation for it. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a new world, you know, and, and this was all kind of starting before COVID came along and shut down production for a while, but it really ramped up then. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen the same thing, like the industry has changed and performers have changed and their priorities have changed. And they've found that, you know, they can be independent content creators and they can make money. And the power is, is in the hands of the creators, not the big production studios and you know and I work for those big production studios and they're great but 
you know, it's, there's something about being able to create and produce your own content, which is super empowering. And if you can, you know, survive financially off of just that, like more power to you. And I can see why that's the route you would want to go. It's, it's great. I just, I just love still being in contact with the fans and then giving them what they want, you know, um, mm. they know what I do and they ask for the mm. things that I do. So it is, it's very empowering. And of course it's like, I'm like their mommy mistress and it's, I'm, I'm very mothering to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, can, I can be, I can be very loving, very romantic. And I can also be a little bit mean to them if they, if, if they ask for it. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. But I mean, it's funny because then there's like situations where you're being mean, quote unquote, you're still taking care of their needs, right? Because that's the, a need that they had, they wanted okay. met because they asked you for it. So it's like a different kind of, <laughs> you know, you're still giving them what they want. So it's, it's interesting. Tanya, yeah. thank you so much for coming on. Um, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, can you tell everybody uh, if they didn't catch your um, URL plugs where they can find you online. Make sure that you follow me on Twitter because I'm very active on Twitter. I'm verified at Tanya Tate. Instagram, it's, um, they took away my verified account. Please. <laughs> it was almost 3 million. They took it away and I can't oh. get it back. So I started a new Instagram, instagram.com slash Tanya Tate XO. My podcast, milfsmakingmoney.com. And of course, if you're listening to this on any of Holly Randall's platforms right now, just go into that search box and search Tanya Tate, Milf Making Money and give my podcast a listen. I'm on OnlyFans, Sex Panther at Tanya Tate. Both of them really easy to find. And of course, if you want to go to my YouTube channel, see me, um, what I get up to in the house, youtube.com slash Tanya Tate Tube, like, subscribe and turn on your notifications and thank you so much for having me and thank you to all the fans that are out there that continue to support me fantastic and you guys can find me at holly randall on instagram and on twitter and of course if you want to support this podcast and get early access to interviews and also watch them live plus behind the scenes from my shoots that you can't get anywhere else, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for listening or watching wherever you are, and I will see you next week. <laughs>